Okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to um, welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Data Protection for Applications Running on Kubernetes. I'm George Castro, Community Manager of VMware and a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Ravi Aluboyina, Senior Architect at Robin.io. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in the, uh, your screen in the Zoom window. Um, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that will be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ravi to kick off today's presentation. Hi, uh, this is Ravi Kumar Alaboyna. I'm the Senior Product Architect at Robin.io. And good morning to everyone. Uh, I work at Robin.io, and um, Robin specializes in running data heavy workloads on Kubernetes platform. So, with that, uh, let's start on our uh, topic today, which is data protection for applications running on Kubernetes. So, before we talk about data protection, let's uh, take a quick look at the the lay of the land uh, as far as Kubernetes is concerned. The, let's look at the state of the applications that are running on Kubernetes today. All of us are pretty aware of the, the first uh, category of applications, which are stateless applications. It can be your Node.js, Python, and web application stacks, Nginx, uh, HAProxy, et cetera. So these are qualified as uh, stateless applications. But there is another big, big segment with uh, three big pillars in them, which is your SQL databases, you know, the traditional oracles of the world, SAPs, MySQL, Postgres databases. They run majority of, of the data workloads in the enterprise. And the new players trying to offset some of the SQL databases are the NoSQL databases, which could be MongoDBs, uh, Cassandra, Couchbase, Influx, etc. They are distributed in nature, and they are trying to take off some of the workloads out of the SQL databases. The third and the biggest segment, uh, which is loosely termed as big data, this is where we have Hadoop stacks, Elasticsearch, Elk, uh, your Kafka pipes, and other database products. So this is a layer plan. They have uh, different segments of, of applications. And this is in green because Kubernetes solves it exceptionally well. Kubernetes is the de facto standard for managing the stateless applications. And it is making grounds into SQL, NoSQL, and Big Data applications. That work is in progress, and Kubernetes is doing that, covering that ground gradually. So that is the state of the applications today on uh, Kubernetes. So with that, Let's look at an application composition in Kubernetes. If you take a simple application like MySQL, traditionally, if you were to deploy it on bare metal or virtual machines, you'd be concerned about storage and compute. Storage could be a direct attached disk, or it, is, it could be coming from SAN array, or your compute, and your compute is a virtual machine, or you install MySQL on a bare metal. So bottom line, you're only concerned about compute and storage. But when you come to Kubernetes platform, Kubernetes is a very, very opinionated framework. So you have to do things in a certain way. And that certain way is this. If you are to run MySQL on Kubernetes, it is not just a PVC and a pod. It's not just storage and compute. You need to have all other elements to give you a fully functional MySQL application. It, it is, there's a deployment, and there is a replica set, there is a service definition, there's a secret and config map. All of this would constitute a MySQL application. So if MySQL is that complex, let's look at the other applications. Is there MySQL? MariaDB is a distributed SQL. Uh, and MongoDB is, is a NoSQL database with lots of components. There are config routers. Uh, there are config servers, there are query routers, and there are uh, shards or replicas. And as you move up 
the application uh, pillars, which is uh, stateless to SQL to NoSQL to big data, the complexity only increases. So if you look at Elk Stack, there are several components in Elk Stack, right? Lots, there's lots of stacks, so there's Kibana. Elastic such itself is a distributed application. So applications on Kubernetes are complex. They involve lots of uh, components. So with that, let's jump on to data protection. What does data protection mean, and why is it dif different in Kubernetes world? Uh, when you talk about Kubernetes, uh, it, it, it comes with a lot of advantages. Uh, it runs containers. It orchestrates containers. And containers, by design, will give you a lot of consolidation. These are highly virtualized and highly consolidated environments. And there are multiple layers to running an application. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely different. It's, when you were to run it on a bare metal, you just take an RPM and install it. But whereas on Kubernetes, it is hidden by multiple layers. You start with Kubernetes and then Docker and then CRI, CNI, and CSI contribute to that Docker, running of the Docker. And these are typically large scale uh, uh, applications. And we are also talking about multiple data centers. What Kubernetes allows us to do is stretch your clusters across geos or across Amazon zones or uh, regions. So if you're talking about multiple data centers here. And the application spectrum also is gradually changing from SQL to NoSQL database and big data. So applications themselves are very complex. So given this environment, what does protection mean? Uh, it, means it means several things. Uh, it could mean encryption or uh, replication. But we're going to talk about uh, three uh, big pillars here. Uh, we got to look at it from three vantage points, which is how do you protect the application deployment from poor planning, resource planning, and why is it important? We'll we'll get into why why do you have to do uh, resource planning and why is it difficult in Kubernetes. The second thing is it is user errors cannot be avoided in a way. So how do we protect the application from user errors? And the third and the biggest bucket is, how do we failures are bound to happen? This can fail, nodes can fail, or sites can fail. And how do we protect the applications from all these failures? Only three. Like I said, there could be many more, uh, but on, in this presentation, we'll focus on these three. So what is resource planning? To explain this, let's talk about uh, a distributed application like Cassandra. The way Cassandra is designed is, you need Cassandra as a distributed application. You pick up three nodes, and we run Cassandra on these three nodes. And any data that goes to one node is replicated to the other two nodes. It is configurable, but typically it is a three-way replicated system. So which means the compute is residing on three physical servers, and the storage is directly attached to the, the physical servers, which means Cassandra is writing to three different disks. So that is a setup on a bare metal. Now, if you were to take that Cassandra and deploy it on Kubernetes, how did it look like? It is very well possible that all the three pods could be placed on a single server. That is the first problem. But Kubernetes provides a, a primitive which, using which you can spread these three pods onto three different physical servers. And that is by using node affinity or anti affinity policies. But there is another problem. Even if the pods are running on three different nodes, the storage could be coming from a software-defined storage stack, which is interfacing with Kubernetes using a CSI plugin. So what happens in this case? Three pods are running on three different servers, but they are writing to the same disk, because these are virtual volumes that were given out by Kubernetes. And what's the problem here? It is not tolerant to disk failures. In a way, we have negated the assumptions of the application Cassandra. Cassandra assumes that I'm writing to three different disks. But because of the virtualized software-defined storage layer, those assumptions are uh, violated. And how do we fix this? So anyway, let's protect Cassandra by doing a proper planning. Obviously, you'll try to split the volumes across multiple disks or multiple nodes. This is the right placement of Cassandra from storage point of view as well as uh, compute. Now, that is Cassandra. Let's talk about Hadoop. Uh, let's move to the extreme right side of our application spectrum. 
Hadoop is not an application, it is a platform. Uh, it is a stack. There are several components in Hadoop. Let's start from Cloudera Manager, which is just an Uber UI layer which will orchestrate the, the entire Hadoop cluster for the Cloudera distribution, of course. So Cloudera Manager is not natively protected. By that I mean it will use a MySQL database to write, to store its the configuration metadata, but that database is not protected. It's not replicated or anything. So which means the uh, Kubernetes has to provide a storage block which is internally replicated. So Cloudera Manager requires a replicated storage. And there are data nodes. And data nodes are similar to the Cassandra nodes. Because data node does uh, three-way replication. And, but we have to make sure that all the three volumes that are supplied to data nodes are coming from three different disk nodes. There is name node, which is active and uh, passive, uh, standby name node and the active name name node. And there is Zookeeper, which is latency sensitive. It has to make an I.O. Uh, in a very, very short duration. Otherwise, it will evict the node. So which means it has to be writing to a local disk, uh, or it has to see latencies as close to the local disk as possible. And there are other components too in Hadoop stack. There is Kudu, uh, there is Solar, so the point is, every component in the Hadoop stack will have different compute and storage requirements, so which means the stack has to be built or planned. The application has to be planned, so it is resilient to any of the faults. The building blocks for doing such planning are you have to worry about compute anti-affinity, location awareness, storage and compute affinity, and IOPS, and of course the high availability of these of these parts. So what are the challenge, challenges in planning these applications? First, the, the summary of what we have discussed is data-heavy applications deal with multiple volumes, like we have seen in Hadoop or Cassandra. Every volume will have different I.O. characteristics. Zookeeper is latency sensitive, whereas the data volumes for data nodes are throughput intensive. Consolidation of multiple applications onto a single Kubernetes cluster makes the problem even harder. And some of these applications have built-in replication, like MongoDBs, Cassandra's, and majority of the NoSQL applications do replication by themselves. So that makes the allocation tricky. So what are we looking for? How can we plan the compute and the storage so all the applications uh, are protected? So we are looking for application-aware storage provisioning stack. When Cassandra is asking for three volumes, the storage stack should understand the three volumes are related, that Cassandra treats these three volumes as special. The storage stack needs to know about it, but that in the current state of Kubernetes, uh, the CSI doesn't know that these three volumes are related. The calls that we get are create a volume, mount a volume. We will not get a volume group. That is not there yet. So what we are looking for is application-aware storage provision. Let's move to the second segment of the data protection, which is how do we protect against user errors? We'll go back to our MySQL example, uh, but, but the workflow applies to any of the applications here. Uh, MySQL is an easy example. The traditional way of protecting against user errors is taking checkpoints or volume snapshots. The question that we need to ask is, is this enough when, when we are running applications on Kubernetes? The short answer is no. Uh, let me explain. Let's say this is our MySQL application. We deployed it on Cassandra using a Helm chart. Now, right after installation, I want to take a snapshot. Let's say we take the snapshot of the volume. This is a, let's say volume-based uh, snapshot of the storage arrays. So we take a snapshot of the volume. This is an initial snapshot. And after that, let's say we created a schema and added some data sets. And so that changed our PVC. Uh, the data goes into the storage. Now we take a snapshot again. So we captured all the data changes in the snapshot. Now this is where things get tricky. Let's say if you were to change the password. In Kubernetes, the password changes to two places depending on how the entry points are written. 
it is possible that the secret gets changed at two places. Now let's take capture the snapshot again. We did capture the secret change. Now let's say we were to change some configuration, we have to make some configuration changes. Again, depending on how the entry point is written, the config changes uh, can will go to config maps as well as the, the PVC. It could be persisted inside the database. So when we take the snapshot, the config changes are captured here. Now if we to roll back to this snapshot, so I want to get rid of all the data changes, password changes, and config changes. I want to get to my initial snapshot. Now if you observe the picture there, the uh, MySQL application, that is a rollback. So we rolled back the PVC. What is the problem with this? So this is the final state after we roll back the application. This is the problem. In the traditional bare metal and virtual machine world, this is called config drift. The configuration of the system has drifted and we, that is not captured in the snapshot. And that is a problem uh, that existed for a long time in, in bare metal world and virtual machines and there are tools designed to solve these problems. Chef, Puppet, uh, there are several other tools which do uh, configuration management. Is there an alternative to this? Can we protect the application better in the Kubernetes world? Of course we can. Let's replay the whole scenario again. Created an application. After the creation, I'll take a snapshot here. This is the initial snapshot. Let's make some data changes, add some tables, take a snapshot again. So we capture the entire application again. Make password changes, capture everything again config changes, the snapshot captures the config changes. So if you've noticed what's happening here is we are not just capturing the data, but we're capturing the configuration, which resides in config maps and secrets. We are capturing the topology, which is how many replicas and what is the topology of the application. And we are also capturing the service definition. So we capture the application in its entirety all the building blocks of the applications are captured in these snapshots. So if you were to revert to any of these snapshots, you'll get a complete view of the application. There is no conflict up here. So what did we talk about? Uh, we talked about how to take the snapshots to protect the applications better. And not all the applications provide checkpoints or snapshots. And typically, Applications are application stacks in real world. So you, you just don't run MySQL and call it an application. I mean, end user facing application, of course. There is all, the solution is built with multiple components in play. So you will have a web server, a middleware, and a database. So in that, all the layers may not provide snapshotting capabilities or checkpointing capabilities. So in Kubernetes, if you have to deploy the entire stack and if the the platform allows you to take a snapshot of the entire stack, that'll be much, much better, peace of mind. And data snapshots are prone to conflict drift issues that we have seen there. The uh, config map secret and volume are at different uh, points in time. And consistency group is very, very critical, and this is the core of a multi-volume snapshotting uh, philosophy. When we snapshot Cassandra, which could be using 20 or 30 volumes, we have to snapshot all the volumes in one shot. Otherwise, you'll have consistency issues. Think about Oracle Rack. Oracle Rack has is ASM, which is uh, not file system based. Uh, you'll have multiple read volumes, uh, which are ASM disks, and data volumes. So we have to snapshot the transaction log as well as the data block in one shot. Otherwise, even though the, uh, the database is asset compliant, you will end up losing data. So which means we will violate, there's a chance to violate the durability aspect of the database guarantees. And when we take uh, snapshots, snapshots they are, we have to flush the application buffers and uh, page cache to give application consistent snapshots. Right. So what are we looking for again? To protect the applications on Kubernetes, 
we will need application level snapshots, not just the data snapshots. So that is the takeaway from, from this exercise. So we've looked at two, two big aspects. One is application aware storage provisioning to protect the applications. And we also need application level snapshots, again, to protect the data heavy applications on Kubernetes. Let's see the, the workflow that is built into Robin here. So you can take any application. So you, create, you can create a Helm-based application on Kubernetes. And with one command, you can take a snapshot of that application. Again, by snapshot, I mean capturing everything, all the aspects of the application, not just volumes. Data, config, and metadata. Snapshots are typically used for three, three purposes. One is uh, rolling back to a point in time, or creating a clone, a thin clone, or pushing the snapshot to cloud so you get uh, DR functionality. So you, with one command, you can roll back any application, the entire application, to a point in time. We can also push the snapshot to an external target to a cloud to protect the, the application again. And we can restore the entire snapshot back. So these are the flows that, um, that are built into Robin, but the concepts in general will apply. So Robin backups are full, fully self-contained. Like I said, we capture everything. Yeah. And the entire application can be restored. It's not just the data or one or two tables. The entire application, including the topology, is rolled back. So now let's look at the third and the biggest aspect of uh, the, the protection, which is hardware and site failures. You need to protect against disk failure, node failures, and site failures. So we've already seen some form of protection offered by the, uh, the proper planning and uh, snapshots, but this is the third phase of it. So why do we need backups? Uh, for the biggest reason uh, is, I think, protecting uh, against upgrades in when the application is running, and also for compliance and auditing reasons. What backup allows you to do is potentially, this form of backup allows you to do is it will make the process of hardware refresh easy, data center migration. You're not locked into a vendor because as long as you have access to backup, you can recreate it somewhere else. So how do backups look, look like? So backups are based off of snapshots. Snapshots are local. Snapshots will give you a consistent point in time image of the application. We have seen the picture on the, uh, on the left side here. Uh, initial snapshots, data changes, password changes, and config changes. These are snapshots. These are four snapshots that we have taken. Backups are off-site. They don't reside on the same media as the original data or the snapshots. So we can register a cloud repository and move the snapshots to the cloud. So when you move it to cloud, you, you have to worry about two aspects, time and cost, of course. So we want to move them to a cheaper storage because the backups could be just a compliance or audit. That is a cost aspect of it. So you move it to S3. S3 is cheaper than EBS on AWS. And the second uh, aspect of that is, uh, is time. During the backup process, you only want to copy the increments. So you save time on the copy. You always go for incremental backups. And when you are resurrecting an application, which means you take an application in the, you take a backup in the cloud, and you want to create that application in the cloud for several reasons. One, you want to migrate an application, which means you, you take incremental backups, put it in the cloud. When it is time, cut the cord and create the application in cloud. So you have moved your application from on-premise into cloud. Or you have an application running on-prem, but you want additional compute capacity to run, complete this joint job. Let's say every quarter you want to run the books. So which means you have the data set, but you want additional compute capacity to, to crunch uh, the numbers at the end of the quarter. So that is when you leverage your backup, create an application in cloud, and run your job there. So this is one of the benefits that the backups provide in this form, which is application on the backup. So how do we save time during this process of cloning? 
what Robin allows you to do is is sort of tiering the S3 layer, which means if you have four terabyte database sitting in of MySQL database or Oracle database sitting in the cloud on S3, S3 is an object store, but applications run on top of EBS, which is a block storage. You do not have to rehydrate the entire four terabytes into the block storage for the application to start. That would be a waste of time and money because you may not read the entire four terabytes of data. So Robin allows you to read only a subset of the data into EBS volumes by doing a storage tiering. So I will go through uh, how we do that a, a little bit. But the point here is for the database to come up in cloud, you might need 100 megs of uh, data. So we should always avoid rehydrating the entire four terabytes in EBS volume. That's what we do. So that is the time aspect in when creating the clones. So this is one of the advantages of, uh, of the backup procedure. So you can think of it as a Git flow. So we have an application running on-prem on any of the Kubernetes distributions, OpenStack, Anthos, uh, open source Kubernetes doesn't really matter. You can uh, create a snapshot. We can do a local clone of that application out of that snapshot, point in time snapshot. Or we can push the snapshot into the cloud storage, which is S3, any of the object storage uh, systems. And we can take that backup and recreate the application in the cloud. So all of this is enabled because of the consistent snapshots and the backup of these snapshots, which are consistent point in time images. So how did we do it? Uh, this is the, the Robin architecture overview. So we take Kubernetes as the centerpiece for orchestrating the, the pods, which is compute. And we quickly realized that orchestrating compute is not enough for hosting data heavy applications. It may be enough for stateless applications. For stateful applications, we need complete control over storage computer network. So we built a distributed storage stack. This is a volume stack with all the enterprise grade features uh, that you expect from big storage vendors. It could be snapshots, clones, quality of service, uh, thin provisioning, compression, encryption. So we, had a, we have a complete storage stack. On the other side, we leveraged multiple uh, networking stacks. We, in a way, we built a programmable uh, network stack. So that gives us uh, control over storage, network, and compute. On top of that, uh, the biggest piece that we have is application workflow manager, or you can call it lifecycle manager. Using that, we were able to provide one-click deployment of the application, one-click protection, which is snapshots, one-click clone, uh, scale, upgrade, and backup. All the workflows are handled by the workflow manager. It will give you an experience of application as a service platform, like maybe Redshift, uh, any of the AWS offerings. So you can do it in, in the private cloud using Kubernetes and leveraging containers. And Robin is a software platform only, and you can deploy it on any of the native Kubernetes platforms, uh, including uh, all the clouds, AWS, Azure, and uh, Google platform. And we have existing deployments, uh, uh, massive deployments, uh, the application stacks uh, vary from Oracle Rack uh, to Hadoop, Elasticsearch. So we have uh, Elasticsearch clusters ingesting uh, huge amounts of uh, events, like 11 billion security events are ingested and analyzed today. And we have multiple petabyte scale uh, Hadoop clusters running uh, in a single server farm. And the uniqueness of Robin is we can run Oracle Rack on containers, and we are running it at scale. We run 400 rack databases uh, in one of our customer sites on Kubernetes. So bottom line, so 
we need application of uh, storage provisioning, application level snapshots, application backups, and of course, you need a storage stack that provides replication features, encryption, uh, and compression features to give an end-to-end -end protection for the application applications running on Kubernetes. And that is Robin Dalai. And thank you. All right, we're going to open it up for questions. Michael Ryan um, asked a question about 15 minutes, and it's a stateful pet sets question mark. Um, but uh, Michael, if you could resubmit your question, maybe with more context, that would be um, really good. I'm going to move on to Roberto's question as well. He asks, uh, does Robin preserve the DB consistency? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. Uh, that's unique to Robin. Uh, because Robin has a concept of application bundle. You can think of it as Helm++. Application bundle is a construct that will allow you to plug in application lifecycle hooks. So you could think of it as Helm chart with application lifecycle hooks. After the application is created, if you want to write some custom logic, let's say seeding the initial tables, that can be put in post create hook. So after all, after all the pod creations, we go out on the post create hook. The consistency point comes from a post snapshot or pre snapshot hook where you can quiz the database and then take a consistent snapshot of all the volumes in one shot. Again, note that because we own the storage stack, we can snapshot all the volumes in one shot. Right. Okay. Uh, Roberto says, thank you, very helpful. Do we have any other questions? We have plenty of time. Uh, let's just give the participants here some time to ask their questions. Sean Sanson. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can answer the uh, maybe Kubernetes pet sets uh, stateful sure. set. Sure. Question. So, stateful sets does is the first initiative taken by uh, Kubernetes to solve the uh, data heavy applications. But that is not a complete solution because what stateful set did was it uh, offloaded the storage question to somebody else, which is the CSI stack. It handled it very cleanly handle the compute part uh, with additional primitives like node affinity, node anti-affinity and all that. But when it comes to storage, stateful, stateful set has limited control on it. It cannot dictate where the block should come from. And there were additions made in Kubernetes like local persistent volumes, but that also didn't solve the entire problem because local persistent volume will take over the entire drive, but that goes against the concept of consolidation. So that also didn't solve the problem. Then I think that, uh, there were strides made into solving the same problem using operators. And operators also had some difficulties in solving the stateful applications. And this has been the flow. And stateful applications, and we are raised. There is more that Kubernetes has to do, and it is doing to, to cover that area. Okay, next question is from Shanzen Song, who says, does Robin work for VMware vSphere storage platform? Um, there is, uh, I'll, I'll take up the, uh, I have a little confusion on the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll address both. Robin can run on VMs, and it can uh, use any storage that is plugged into a virtual machine. So it will just treat the virtual machine as, as a host, and it can run the top of that, uh, like it can run on AWS. Uh, there is a unique value prop on AWS and, and any SAN attached storage because Robin can actually orchestrate the block devices attached to the hosts. For example, it can orchestrate the EBS volumes attached to AWS instances. If the question is about, can I use a Robin storage stack as a storage ba backend to my ESX or vSphere? The answer is yes and no. We don't have it today, and so we are planning. It's in the roadmap as an ISCSI target. Okay, uh, Govind asks, can you touch on the restore options, like what needs to be done to restore some objects? Just one click. <laughs> this is a short answer. Uh, when, I, when you say some objects, uh, Uh, so you can, ideally, I think in order to avoid the conflict drift problems, you you want to uh, revert revert the entire application. 
which is using a single command, uh, Robin Restore or Robin Rollback. If you're doing it from backup, you do a Robin Restore. If you're doing it from a snapshot, you do a Robin Rollback. But if you want to restore a particular object, uh, there are ways to do it. Uh, essentially, you need a running instance of that. You can create a thin clone, uh, take that object, and replace it. Because we, again, like, like I said, we capture everything. So if you want to take just the secret, you can you can get the secret as well. You can create a thin clone, take the components that you need, and delete the clone. And if you're talking about, let's say, hypothetical case, uh, you let's say you want to create or restore a particular namespace in uh, in Cassandra, or you want to create a clone of a particular namespace or a key key space in Cassandra. Again, the lifecycle hook comes into play here. You want to clone a Cassandra database, but you want a particular portion of it, or you want to do data masking. Then you will say, you will write a post clone hook. Robin will create a clone of the application, and it will trigger the post clone hook, so which will go and do data masking. So many of the things will be enabled by the Robin application bundles, and uh, it is as easy as writing Helm chat, or in fact, more easier, easier than writing Helm chat is what I say. Okay, uh, Vikram asks, does Robin.io provide volume replication and a way to put them on the same host as per application localization as the original volumes are created in some host? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And uh, that is one of the interesting aspects. Robin has this, uh, it's a very, very fine-grained uh, uh, policy engine. It supports replication. Uh, you can set the fault domain for replication. You can say my replicas need to be on two different drives or nodes or racks or data centers. That's one level. And the other aspect of that is I want my compute and storage to be coming from the same node, which is what we call compute and storage affinity. Let me see if I have it captured here. Uh, this not short, sorry. Oh, I don't have to. But um, so you can always have uh, so in a in a consolidated storage play, a software defined storage play, the blocks could be coming from anywhere. Robin provides a, a policy which says if my data node is running on a physical server one, make sure you get the data blocks from that same server. So that privileges. You can set storage and compute affinity, anti-affinity, which will type storage and compute. You can set fault domains for application, and you can set uh, compute anti-affinity policies and round robin policies. You can also say that container X should not be running on the same node as container Y. I don't want to run data nodes and zookeeper nodes on the same server. That is a policy. And you can also say, I don't want to run data nodes and zookeepers. I don't want to carve out volumes for zookeeper and data node from the same disk or the same host. They're very, very fine-grained policies. And we had to design all these policies because we started with data-heavy applications. And we do run customer environments which are uh, highly protected. <laughs> Long answer to a short question. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, Jacob asks, is Robin available in a developer or trial license? Yes, yes. Uh, there is get.robin.io, and we have a Slack channel available. Uh, please uh, visit get.robin.io. Okay, Gavin Dan asks, how does Robin help in site failure kind of scenarios, and also Robin's backups are certified by the software vendors like Oracle? Uh, it is. Uh, yes, I uh, certified meaning. Uh, so we use RMAN uh, for certain kinds, but it's it's as certified as uh, SAN snapshots. For example, uh, if let's say you have an Oracle running off of SAN, and if you have to snapshot SAN, uh, if Oracle certifies it, we are like a SAN platform. And in that case, uh, if they are certified, I think we are certified too. Uh, as far as the technology goes, yes. Okay. 
Uh, Wan Chung asks, how does Robin IO compare to AWS ECS, Fargate, and EKS and capabilities? So EKS, uh, uh, Robin come, you can install Robin as an operator on top of any existing Kubernetes. Um, Fargate, I am not really sure, uh, but EKS for sure. Yeah, so we support EKS, AKS, and uh, Pivotal Cloud, and all the hosted uh, Kubernetes services. You can install Robin. Okay, and, and when you said EKS, did you also mention AKS? Sorry, I just want to make sure that we have that. AKS, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> all right. Azure Container Service, yeah. Okay, uh, Roberto asks, what kind of persistence may I use to store the Robin backups? S3, Azure Blob, local NAS, et cetera, et cetera. So we can use uh, any of the object storage systems. Uh, let me show here. So you can use S3. Uh, so you can use S3, uh, Azure Blob Store. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. S3, Azure Blob Store, uh, and GCS, Google Cloud Storage. Okay. And we also support NFS if you have local, uh, if you want to store local backups. Okay, Eric would like to know what's Robin IO's pricing structure and or model? I, uh, it's based on storage and compute, uh, but I'd suggest please uh, contact our, uh, uh, our sales folks or just go to get.robin.io. There's a Slack channel available and somebody will uh, contact you. Okay, uh, Jacob asks, how does Robin recognize what, an what is an application in Kubernetes? Very good question. Uh, so that is a secret sauce in a way, but uh, uh, I'll give you some of that away. So we use uh, uh, labels and selectors as, as one, and there are many components, because uh, if you look at Kubernetes objects, uh, it's, it's very, they're very loosely coupled entities. You cannot tie all the objects together. They, you need to look at labels and selectors, you need to look at some annotations, and you, you need to look at object mappings in some case. So we do all of that, and we constitute an application. So you use a big Helm chart to create multiple stateful sets, replica sets, and uh, deployments. And you give Robin a directive which says, Robin app register. And you can give labels and selectors, or you can just say, this is my Helm chart. Robin will go crawl and figure out the, the connections between all the objects and, and create an application boundary for you. Okay, and Robert wanted to specify better from his previous question. May I use a specific persistent volume to target backups performed by Robin? Yes, you can. Uh, so again, application for Robin is a loose construct. So you, you can just put a single PV or a PVC in the application construct and it's a take a snapshot on backup. So because the application only constitutes a PV and a PVC, a backup can be done. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, Vikram wants to know, are you using the CSI driver for shared as well as dedicated storage, or do you have your own storage driver in addition to CSI? No, we, have, we write to CSI. We write okay. to CSI, but uh, we run as a daemon set. So there are some functions which are not supported in the CSI stack or offloaded to our agents. Okay. I, that's what Vikram wants to know, but uh, we didn't write a CSI driver. So we... Uh, we just implemented the, the CSI that is published out there, but we have an agent running. Uh, Robin is a, uh, runs as a daemon set. Some of the functions are offloaded to agent. Okay, and that is, we are caught up on questions now, so let's give people another few minutes. Here we go, Eric wants to know, oh, uh, that's just a reminder that you can keep on asking questions, everyone. Uh, we still have plenty of time here. Eric wants to know, how do you support RWX access mode for the PV? Uh, so actually we do support because we, we actually run Oracle Rack. Uh, and the protection aspects of the RWX are, uh, are offloaded to Robin. Uh, let me explain. I, I think Oracle Rack will need multi, uh, shared access uh, to the PV. And you can always use our uh, RWX mode. But okay. if volume is single mounted, Robin Robin provides that consistency guarantee that no two computes can write to the same volume. 
those are fenced at our storage layer, even in the network partition case. Okay, Eric, hope that answers your question. If not, please post a follow up. Uh, Cafe Wang, sorry if I mispronounced that, asks Is the NetApp Trident supported? Uh, no. Okay. And we are caught up on questions. Do we have any other questions? Let's just give people some time there. I know there's a delay sometimes. All right, great. Well, thank you, Ravi, for a great presentation and for answering all the user questions. Um, thank you for joining us today. This webinar and the recording and the slides will be online later today at the usual places. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. And with that, thanks, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you.